Broadcasting from the Stuart Title Studio on Broadway in Tucson, Arizona, you are now tuned in to The Mark Bishop Show, discussing life and business with guests from all over the world. And now your host, Mark Bishop. Well, welcome to the premiere edition of The Mark Bishop Show. And I'm very honored today to have a very special lady by the name of Emily Eldridge. And she's launching my show here at BRX, which, uh, thank you, Emily. I really appreciate that. Oh, wow. And, of course, the show can be heard on uh, The Mark Bishop Show site as well. This lady, very special. She was raised in Dallas by her amazing parents, so I'm told, Lincoln, Susan. And I do welcome her. She was a lamplight to school, uh, then the Hawker Day School for Girls, and finally Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, where she majored in theatre. So my first question to you, Emily, is why do you think you were drawn to the theatre? Oh, wow. I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question. Um, when I was a young girl, I loved to sing. But what was interesting about that is that actually I was scared to sing in front of anyone. So I, I recently told this story on a storytelling uh, on the stage in Dallas about how I would um, take my little tape recorder um, and take it into my parents' bedroom because they're the only house with carpeting. <laughs> or at least they, they were like the furthest away from everywhere else. And I locked my parents' bedroom door right. and then I hid underneath uh, their curtains and and I'd pull the curtains over this little uh, little love seat and I would turn on my little tape recorder because of course this was like early 80s you know we didn't have CDs already not even right. Walkman I don't think and I would play Air Supply okay. and I would sing to Air Supply and so the point is is that I would sing and I always knew I loved to sing and I always knew I was good at it but I was always so scared to show it and so that really started it off. Um, and I think over the years, I just finally got up the courage to to perform. And um, I think it's a combination of, of I, I love being on stage. That's where I feel really lit up. Um, and I really think that's important. We've got to you've got to honor what lights you up. You've really got to do what lights you up because, as, as I often say, when when you light up, you light up the world. That's and, it. Um, that's the passion, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So, and I just love playing characters. I love singing. I love acting. I mean, well, after graduating, you headed off to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So there must have been some goals there. You uh, you were acting and singing, and as well, I think you volunteered at the Shriners Hospital for Children, mm -hmm. and this is where you met your darling uh, Paco. Yes, yes, Paco. Right. Yes. Uh, the man who would become later on her husband, of all things. And this particular lady, it's a long story, but we're, we're going to do it short within the hour. But I'd like always to get the background of my guests because it's interesting how their story evolves and what she's doing now to help other people. It's rather fascinating. Now, the actress of you in Los Angeles, uh, are you a member of SAG and uh, AFTRA? What does that stand for? Uh, SAG-AFTRA. Actually, at the time, they weren't merged, but they merged in the meantime. It's the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. Okay. Yes. Uh, you did independent short films uh, in Dallas, various commercials and industrial uh, industrials on camera, uh, TV show host, uh, produced and starred in an independent film. That was pretty busy. What was that? called? What was that about? Um, that was actually a true story that was written by the woman who also directed it and it was set in Texas and it was about her aunt who had been in a very abusive relationship and the journey that she went through. And so uh, someone in San Antonio knew me and had talked to her and said, you've got to talk to this girl. You know, she's an actress in New York and because I was in New York at the time and I ended up producing it, starring in it and all that kind of good well, stuff. Well, that's it. You moved to New York City where you also acted and sang again, performed in cabaret clubs and musicals you recorded songs you were a backup singer in wedding bands and um well any distinct memories from that particular period when you were doing that work in new york was there anything special that came out of that for you well, New York was a very interesting period of my life. And, you know, you had asked me about being on stage and performing and what is it that drew me to it. And, you know, I actually moved to Los Angeles because I'd been a theater major in college. And my I had a godmother who was um, – uh, she was an actress in Los Angeles and it was one of those things where I could live with her and I could at least try just try the acting thing right I think it's always really important to honor what it is that calls uh, calls to us and so um, yeah and then when I got to New York so I was doing uh, acting in, in Los Angeles and um, and then 
a number of things precipitated my move to New York where I was doing more singing, as you said, cabaret mm-hmm. and stuff. But then actually, uh, and that was in 2000, and then 2001, 9-11 happened. Right. So yeah. that was a, that was, that changed everything, frankly. Well, uh, where did the graphic designer come in? The, uh, you had your own handmade car company, uh, designing logos, websites for companies and non-profits. And this is when, I think this was the timing, wasn't it? When September. 11 happened in 2001, right? Um, I think that the the graphic design came after that. But, I, but what I feel like you're getting at here, which, I, which is great, is the fact that I've had a very um, circuitous and varied uh, career. Um, I've tried a lot of different career paths. And it really came down to trying to figure out what's my purpose hmm. and trying to figure out what's the best way that I can serve humanity. Right. And, what the uh, heck am I doing here? Impact. Yeah, what am I doing here? And so that's why like, I jumped from acting to singing mm-hmm. and then I did graphic design. And, um, and, and really what I recognize now is that it was my brain was, it was like, that I'm very, very blessed that I have a lot of different talents, mm-hmm. um, which is Multi-skilled. It's a gift from God. It is. done it about it. It's a wonderful gift. And at the same time, it can also be extremely frustrating to figure out how do you satisfy all these parts of you um, so that you can really feel whole and at peace. Right. And so that was really my struggle. And it was during that time, too, that I would have these long conversations with my father, um, Link, who is a not-for-profit executive search consultant in Dallas. And he travels all the time. And so he'd visit me in New York. And we'd have these long, you know, we just walk down the street and um, I'd talk about my frustrations with trying to figure out, you know, who am I here to be? What am I here to do? And I'm good at this and I'm good at that. And I'm trying to figure out how to bring it all together. And no one thing completely fulfills me Mm because that was the main issue. It was like with acting, I was doing well, but I could feel my heart was just Yeah, I I can relate to it implicitly because I really do feel the same. And I know that there are thousands of people out there who go through the same thing. Absolutely. So hopefully by the time this uh, show finishes today, they're going to learn something from you. Oh, good. Right? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I have a lot to share. Now, we're going to go back to a bit of sadness. You ran down to Ground Zero. Uh, you lived there for two weeks as a spontaneous first responder. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're moving supplies, providing emotional support for the men and women coming off the pile. Had you experienced anything like this at all before, Emily? No, certainly not that scale, not that level of destruction. Um, I've spent, I had spent time um, volunteering with people who were in a lot of crisis and and having a lot of emotional struggles um, and dealing with physical effects of that as well. Um, I had had some experience with that. I did some volunteerism at, at a hospital in, in India prior to that. And as you know, I, I'd spend a lot of time at the Triners Hospital for Children in Los Angeles, you know, where I met young kids who um, had been burned all over their bodies. And of course, my husband was one of those patients, not who'd been burned. He was born without legs and has a uh, total of six fingers. Um, but the point is that, um, no, this was the first really catastrophic situation um, in which it was, you know, destruction everywhere. Um, and, and at the same time, though, I really find it, it's very important to balance that with um, that there was also so much love. Well, so much love at Ground Zero, too. Months later, there must have been because you and other first responders founded the World Cares Center. Right. Mm -hmm. And you opened uh, the community center September space to address the needs of their uh, fellow first responders. But soon after that, you fell ill with uh, severe eczema all over your body, coupled with bouts of depression. Uh, This couldn't have been an easy time for you. No, it was extremely painful, Uh, physically painful, emotionally painful. Um, and it was very hard because I was, I had really devoted myself, my, all of my free time to spending time with firefighters and helping other first responders because a lot of them didn't want to talk to therapists and do things like that. But, but when they met me and they found out that I'd actually been at ground zero and I wasn't a therapist, but I could be there and I could listen to them and give hugs and things like that. They were really, um, unloading a lot of their emotional. I I guess it must be some sort of trust they had in you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. I mean, that's, that's often what they told me, um, is that they, they just trusted me implicitly. And um, and so I, I really discovered that I had a calling and I had a gift for being of support. And so then getting sick 
um, during that time was really painful because I wanted to keep serving as much as I could. And yet the illness was actually preventing me from doing that. I mean, mm-hmm. there were times when I just couldn't get out of bed. Um, and, and I was covered in eczema all over my face and my body. I mean, as people have what, said. What caused that, do you know? Well, so it, I didn't know for a long time. Um, I, 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 I tried all different kinds of treatments. And, um, you know, I did acupuncture and I'd go to doctors and things mm. like that. But what I finally have uh, concluded after this many years, I mean, what it's been 18 years, mm-hmm. almost 18 mm-hmm. years since the Trade Center, um, is that over time I've learned a lot about what the illness was about. And I would say it's a combination of physical and emotional. Um, the physical part being that I, I did develop some chemical sensitivities as a result of being um, exposed at the, uni- at the, tr- at the World right, Trade Center right. with all of as the things in the air as a first mm. responder. And so definitely developed some chemical sensitivities and at the same time um, some emotional issues. And I think it was the combination of the physical stresses as well as the emotional stresses that I had taken on myself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really had like – I had chosen to actually take on people's pain. And this was before I learned the importance yeah. of self-care, oh, right? Why am I yeah, yeah, so it really did force me to learn that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but then even more in, even more recently, I mean, it's been – over the years, I, I would experience these massive bouts of this horrible, you know, being so extremely ill and not being able to work. Um, and, and then I would have periods where it would kind of go away and then it would come back. And even recently, I discovered because I was still having flare-ups last year, but then, but then, in just in the last few months, I've experienced even greater healing now and relief from it because of certain choices, personal choices I've made in terms of my own boundaries, mm. my own self empowerment, um, recognizing areas of my life with it, that I've been working too hard to fix. In this case, like situations that I really couldn't control, right. and then once I finally made those the, the deep empowering choices to say, okay, you know what, I release this, I let this go and I choose to do what's right for me, actually my skin has been incredible, even more incredible since. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's a long answer to your question, but it's yeah. because it was so multi Well, you're looking good. I, but not you. on video, but, but, it, but it looks terrific now. Thank so, you. Thank you. I mean, there are a lot of people who suffer this. Yes. A lot of people. Now, yes. currently, um, and we're speaking with uh, Emily Eldridge. She's a leader, healer, and advisor uh, to quickly remove leaders' blocks. Now, leaders do have blocks, triggers, blind spots, that set them on their highest purpose and path so that they can make the best possible difference in the world. Now, this is what you're doing for others at the moment, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're still a speaker yourself. You do conferences and events all around the world, Mm -hmm. Uh, USA, China, Colombia, Guatemala, and the UK, twice, in fact, at the United Nations Mm -hmm. and twice in the British Parliament. What was that like? What an experience that would be. It's... Amazing. It's it's amazing to get to speak in a space that is the center of so many major events that uh, of so many major events that happen in the world, and that's the center of the world of attention of the world. So, like the at the United Nations, and the thing is that the United Nations in the building itself, there are a lot of different events that happen, and so it was all these amazing sort of things that coincided to make that possible the first time, mm-hmm. and then the second time I actually got to really speak in the, one of the greater assembly rooms about my work, and so there's this incredible. Of course, it's intimidating. It's a little scary, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time time it's so for me it was so exciting to get to share um, my work with the world and feeling really like I'm sharing it with the world um, on a kind of world stage and the same thing with British Parliament too you know walking through the halls of Westminster Palace and uh, sorry Palace of of Westminster and um, you know getting to and also at the same time what I was doing in both those situations was working with young leaders from around the world and so it was very exciting for them as well of course because I mean they're from all kinds of countries and they'd raised money just to just to have the experience so was was this the time when you realized that uh, you have this gift now and this is where you started to look at this career heavily. This is where you were working with others. I've been working with others prior to then. Okay. So my work, uh, the work but that I do now. But we're building up to. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Now, you did two TEDx's as well. And one was the very first. I, I found this interesting when I read this. But one was the very first TEDx in a prison. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, mm-hmm. come on. you got to share that. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I was going to say, it's like you're asking about the United Nations and British Parliament. No, it's a prison. And now we go know? to prison. Uh-huh. Yeah, now we go to prison. Um, yeah, well, it's funny you put it that way because some, like, just the other day I was speaking to a group. I was running a panel in Dallas and about the art of healing. And I said something like, well, you know, something I learned from the guys in prison. All right. No, I think I said something like something I learned when I was in prison. And there was this this kind of curious look of like, the yeah. people in the crowd. And I said, no, 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 no. When, when I work with men in prison, when I work, um, I have not been to prison um, as an inmate. Um, but it, that was that honestly, and, and this may sound crazy, <laughs> but working in prison, especially with the people with whom I've worked and when the organizations with whom I've worked in prison is, is one of, is just been the most incredible, powerful experiences of my life. Um, it's weird, but really the word that comes to mind is nirvana. It's blissful for me because mm. I'm working with these people who are so – a lot of times they're not what's called general population. So it's not like guys who've just ended up in prison, no. just fresh off of their crime or what have you, having committed a crime. Um, really, a lot of them are the men who've already spent some years in prison and they've right. already been working on themselves. Right. And so it's, it's, it's an incredible thrill to get to work with these people who are so – eager to heal they know uh you know the crimes they committed they've taken responsibility for them they really um, want to get out and they, they really want to heal and they also want to get to the core root of what is it that caused them to behave this way because this stuff doesn't happen in a mm-hmm. vacuum and so yeah but getting to do that the, so i worked with the men in prison um in 2012 i think and then in 2013 they asked me to do a ted talk and that was really scary too for a mm-hmm. different reason because yeah, it be. uh and, and it had nothing to do with the inmates you know <laughs> And, or being in prison, because um, I actually feel very safe with them in prison. Those guys would absolutely protect me no matter what. Well, they, they really wanted to heal themselves, yeah. understand why, yeah. so they wouldn't be a repeat offender as exactly, well. Exactly, but, but looking forward to getting out. Well, and some Having them, some life. Yes, and the truth is some of them will probably never get out. And at the same time, then they recognize shame. that. Yeah, and there are some... But if they've learned inside, they can help others, right? Yes, and that's something that we also talk about, is how can they make a difference from the inside? But what I was going to say that was scary about the TED Talk, um, it, about doing a TED Talk, frankly is that, you know, I'm used to being able to speak for an hour and I get up and I talk and I have my thing sort of um, uh, outlined. Yes, I don't everything. think you'd have any problems with that. I had- <laughs> <laughs> nice compliment there. Thank you. Um, is, that, is that I had, I actually had 10 minutes. And so it was 10 Impossible. minutes. It was, it was hard. It was hard. It was hard not because I talk a lot, but also because, you know, kind of like you, you, we were talking about, um, I don't know if it was before the show, that I have a lot to share. And so to have to be disciplined enough yeah. <laughs> to actually um, put it into 10 minutes was, was quite a challenge. But there's some wonderful uh, videos online that taught me how to do that. Emily Aldridge is a leader, healer, and advisor. We touched on that before. Now... She is the creator of this. This is an alternative healing uh, concept, segment, doing, belief, whatever you want to call it. But she is the creator of the drawing out process, the discoverer of M powers and X powers and founder of the new self empowerment. Okay, give it to me straight all in (laughs) one minute. (laughs) <laughs> oh, don't do that to me, Mark. All don't right. do that to me. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, okay. So, you know, you referred to the physical struggles that I've had, the mm-hmm. the eczema, the depression, um, and and also, frankly, a lot of the patterns that I'd learned, some of the patterns I'd learned as a child, and then what they resulted in in certain behaviors as an adult, like in terms of my relationships, uh, not valuing myself, not honoring myself or taking care of myself. And um, so... Um, and some of the messages I received growing up, et cetera, et cetera. The point is that uh, in about 2008, 2008, 2009, everything in my life fell apart. Um, I'd really, up until then, I'd finally uh, felt like I was on path with a relationship and a business, and we were doing amazing things and creating this website. And then um, all of a sudden, everything fell apart, and I fell into a deep, dark depression. And what I realized, I realized a lot of things during that deep, dark depression. One of them was that I realized that I'd put my onus, the onus of my power and my joy in everything outside of me. 
instead of in myself. So in other words, I was expecting that relationship, that business, that collective vision that we had to be the things that would bring me joy. From the outside. From the outside. Well, we all do that. We're we all guilty all, of that. We all do that. And so that's where during that, when everything really fell apart and I didn't know who I was and I had, I really had no sense of identity and I felt I was suicidal for a part of that time. Um, where I really discovered that it's I It's really very hard to, to believe that, you know, because <laughs> you seem to have everything going for you, but, you know, you're speaking on behalf here of thousands of women who have been in the same predicament. A lot of sudden depression all the way down there, got everything going for them maybe in the world where others would say, God, if I only had half of what you had, Mm -hmm. boy, what I could do. But, you know, you suffered as well. I did. And and interestingly enough, part of what actually... um, exacerbated that suffering was that I was telling myself those messages. What's wrong with you, Emily? You have all this support or you have this loving family and Mm. you have all these things going for you. Why are you depressed? What's wrong with you? And so that actually turned into my shaming myself for how I felt, which did that make it better? No, it made it worse. And so then I hated myself more and hated myself more Um, and hating myself for not just picking myself up the way I needed to. And I, and, and there is men, it's women, it's a lot of people who struggle with this. And so that's also something I find really important that really someone's external circumstances have uh, can can often have um, they can be misleading. I've met plenty of people with tons of money and tons of support and they can do whatever they want in their yeah. lives and they're severely depressed right. or they hate themselves or they're or they're completely giving themselves over to everybody else and not taking care of themselves. And so I that that's something that I had to really honor within myself was I remember actually one day when I just said to myself, you know what, I keep shaming myself for how I'm how I'm feeling and keep trying to figure out what's wrong with me. And I finally just said to myself, you know what, Emily, it's not about right or wrong. It just is. This is how I feel. That's the reality. Right. So I need to accept that the reality is I'm severely depressed. I'm really accept unhappy. I'm really okay. sad. And just honor that. Mm-hmm. And that actually was one of the major steps in, in my own salvation from freedom from that depression. Okay. Now, you discover that within all of us, mm-hmm. right, three types of inner struggles, mm-hmm. which you call X powers, as well as the three inner M powers, E-M powers, which apparently hold all of the wisdom, love, and strength that we need to live a truly powerful life. This emanated from all that you were experiencing. Yes. Yeah, so during that deep, dark night of the soul, um, that's when, you know, I'd done a lot of spiritual you know, practices and work and, and my mother's a psychotherapist and I'd read a lot of books prior to that. Um, but when everything really fell apart, uh, it, it really forced me to look at my own inner demons and my own inner struggles and study them. Now, it was extremely painful. I'm not sitting saying I sat here just passionately, just looking mm. at the inner demons and the struggles, but I really, you know, it forced me to face them. And so by facing them is how I learned the truth about these inner struggles that I found that are universal. And so when you talk about, well, first of all, you mentioned the drawing out process. The drawing out process is something that I created during that time to free myself of the pain, to free myself of these, you know, the inner critics and the wounded children inside of me and the the angry parts that mm-hmm. were very reactive. Mm-hmm. So the drawing out process came out of that. And then in doing the drawing out process with others is I started seeing these patterns among those types of inner struggles. And that's how I discovered the three types of X power. So they're the three types of inner struggles and they're universal. Okay. We all have them. And it's it's like I use the term X powers because a lot of people would call these like, you know, uh, inner demons or the ego or blocks or triggers or um, you know, parts of the shadow. Right. But I use the term X powers to be well for a lot of reasons actually, because X powers, X means um against. So they feel like they work against our power because we struggle with them. We try to push back against okay. these X powers. But also because X means former. And that's what they taught me. My X powers actually taught me okay. that they are not bad, that they're simply parts of our power that have been distorted by pain and fear. 
Hmm. And they're really parts of our M powers. So what I teach and what I learned in my own journey was that these there's nothing bad or wrong about any of us. No. That what we perceive to be bad or wrong is simply a part of us that's been distorted by sure. pain or fear. I like that. And that when you actually face and you there's no right or wrong, part, right? It's, it's not right or wrong. And no. well, and also that you know they may they you know they may be like inner programs, almost like a computer program. If you've got this some you know you need to update the software. So we have these parts of us that that. At some time in our lives, you know, let's say an inner critic, at some time in your life, that inner critic may have really served to protect you. Maybe you had a really tough mother or father who wanted you to get perfect grades, or you were in a very scary environment, and that inner critic really kept you in line or pushed you to go further. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that as we get older, those parts of us become outdated. Now that inner critic, rather than actually protecting us and supporting us, is actually sabotaging us, sabotaging us in our relationships, sabotaging us, sabotaging, sabotaging us in our businesses, um, causing us to overwork, um, causing us not to take care of ourselves. So, and, and we get those voices that tell us we're not good enough, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so the point is that inner critic is not bad. It is not a bad part of you. It's simply a part of you that learned to behave that way in response to what it felt you needed when you were a child or as a result of a trauma or what have you. So that's what I teach. And actually, those X powers then are the ones. They're the ones who led me Mm -hmm. to discover the M powers. They're the ones who were like, we're not bad. We are just, you know, misunderstood. And so what the drawing out process is, it permanently transforms those inner struggles back to being... Uh, whole and at one and at peace with our inner powers. Those right, now we, powers. we need to explain this here that we're literally talking about drawing out. Yep, yep, yep. This isn't yep. just, a, you know, a terminology. Mm-hmm. This is sitting down with crayons. Yep, yep. And literally drawing how your feeling or whatever it is inside you looks like. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, what it really it starts off when I'm working with a client, for example. I mean, you, you're you're regarded as a genius, oh. exhilarating, a brilliant. Some other things I've read about you: a miracle worker, a truly life changing experience, and up there with sliced bread. Hadn't we been doing this type of thing with psychotherapy though for a long time? What was missing? So, oh, well, that's a whole other conversation. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychotherapist. No. My mother's a psychotherapist, and she's a genius. She's brilliant um, and amazing. But w- what is um, it then that – why wasn't this discovered before? Okay, so there, there, there are a few things that come to mind. Um, one is that what I find is that um, when you – like, okay, so talk therapy, right? A lot of psychotherapy is talk therapy. So if I ask you to talk about how you're feeling, your left, the left brain is the logical, reasonable, rational part of the brain, you know, very practical, uh, strategic, et cetera. And its language is words, whereas the right side of the brain is more about emotions and images and creativity and um, intuition. And its language is images, mm-hmm. is, is pictures. And so the thing is, if, if I say, I want you to tell me about how you're feeling, talk to me about how you're feeling, what you're asking of the person is to uh, have the left brain interpret what's going on in the right brain. Remember, using language to figure out what's going on in the right brain. Instead, what if you let the right brain speak in its own language? So it's literally like, quote unquote, coming from the horse's mouth. Mm. So when we allow ourselves to express through drawing, and, and there's no artistry, this is not about being an artist at all. I mean, stick figures work. <laughs> but when you tap That's in, all you'd get out of me, I'll oh, tell you. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes that's all I do if I need to draw something. It's like a little stick figure. Right. But the whole point is you're actually engaging that right brain and you're allowing it to speak in its own language. Right. And that way more information comes through. So that's one thing. That's one aspect of why this works so extremely well is you're actually – you're bypassing that analytical left brain that wants to interpret and wants to figure out and just saying, no, 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 it's okay. You don't need to figure this out. Right. I just want to know what's going on. You know, what's it – what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you feeling? What are you noticing? And let it come out in images. And sometimes it comes out in words too. So that's one part. Another part is that when in the drawing out process is I actually talk directly to those parts inside the person that are struggling that are carrying that pain or carrying those wounds or carrying those beliefs or behaving that way or feeling that way. And Mm -hmm. some people might think that's crazy, but it's so ridiculously simple. There's no hypnosis. So what I'll tell how I'll typically do a session is that we'll identify what's at the core of the current struggle they're having. And then I have them draw that part, whatever's coming out. And even if it's just a big black hole, or maybe it's a mean, angry monster, but just draw it and trust it to come out as it's supposed to come out and then I have them name it 
give it a name or let it name itself, really. Mm -hmm. And then I actually have a conversation with that part of the person. And as I said, no hypnosis. I literally will just will just say, okay, its name is Bob the Bully. And I'll tell the person, just close your eyes. And I'm just going to say, hey, Bob, are you there? And I say, (laughs) let Bob speak. I know it sounds crazy, but it and and most of my clients are like, no, no, no. You're right. They're like, (laughs) someone told me to come to you, lady, but I don't know. But then when they go through it, they're blown away. They're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I haven't thought about that, you know, that memory in a long time. Because what we're doing, again, we're getting it from the horse's mouth. We're getting it from so, so-called so horse's mm-hmm, mouth. I've never mm-hmm. actually talked to a horse inside of someone. Um, <laughs> I've talked to walls and other things. Well, that's a good old saying because yeah. the, the jockey won't tell you as the horse can. Yeah. <laughs> So, but the point is, is in that part that's carrying the wounds or behaving those ways or trying to protect the person in its, in its, in its unique ways, it tells me why it's there. So again, we're bypassing that left brain and we're allowing the core, the source of the pain to, to speak. And by doing that, there's so much healing that happens because it's coming straight from the source. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, ah, there's this relief because that part, the reason why it's usually making so much noise and causing so many problems is because it's desperate to be heard and honored. So that's really what we do. And that would be the third thing is we're going straight there and honoring that part, not trying to rationalize it away or breathe it away or any of those other things, but really listening to it as though it's another part. It's a part of the person and letting it share its story and its truth. And then the rest of the process is actively taking it through other steps that that permanently transform it. So it's no longer in pain anymore. You are currently listening to The Mark Bishop Show, broadcasting from the Stuart Title Studio on Broadway in Tucson, Arizona. Back to the show. So... On the Mark Bishop Show, Emily Eldridge is the guest. It's the drawing out process, the Dr. Op for short. It's very <laughs> simple yet extremely <laughs> powerful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Groundbreaking. It's a seven step technique that heals individual inner struggles. And, you know, you, you, you own this. Two hours or less mm-hmm. is feasible to happen for somebody. Mm-hmm. We've talked about how it works drawing, talking, uh, loving acceptance. Help struggling inner parts feel acknowledged and heard. Mm -hmm. Then thanking and explaining free. uh, Well, it's to free them of their old patterns, isn't it, really? And to Mm -hmm. guide them to adopt new, more loving and empowering ways. I guess once people feel really loved, supported, they're going to feel empowered. Absolutely. All right. Now, this came out of, uh, this was created out of Emily's sheer determination to free herself of inner struggles. Um, the droop yields results for many that are not short of miraculous. Well, the, the droop. The drop? <laughs> the, the droop is the, there too. Right. It's a, no, it's a spelling mistake. The, do, oh. the doctor op, as it's called. The droop, though. That's the a dropping out that's process. Yeah. What years of therapy couldn't resolve a healed? Now, I can see why. A lot of people, I can see why here, just a couple of hours. The draft has an amazing result with everything from sexual trauma to emotional neglect to addiction issues. I'm reading off certain parts here that uh, you get to read about her, and uh, it's rather interesting how they write about that. You've got lots of testimonials on the New Self-Empowerment website. Mm-hmm. That's the www. The new self empowerment testimonials. You travel all over the place and doing it. We've talked about the drawing out process. You know, how did you become, in a nutshell, how do you how did you become a leader, healer, and advisor? So I'd been doing so in two thousand nine is when I first started discovering the drawing out process, and then I started working with people in two thousand ten because um, it took about a year to develop the whole process. And then you know, over the years, I've worked with a lot of different people, as I've already mentioned. You know, I work with young leaders, mm-hmm. I work with um, uh, inmates, I've worked with just you know regular clientele, and I I um, and then in the meantime, you know, we've talked about being ill. And, and so there were times in there during that time when, you know, I, I couldn't work. I was so extremely sick. And so, gosh, it might've been 2015, 2016. I don't remember, but, um, I was going through one of my extreme illnesses, uh, and I couldn't work. 
Um, I could barely get out of bed. And mm-hmm. My sweet, wonderful husband, who you've mentioned, um, was just supporting both of us. He was he's amazing because um, I, I couldn't function. And so I literally could all I could do was well, lay it down. amazes me how he functions. I'll tell you. that. Oh, he's, he's motivational. I he, mean, if we go to the side and we see the gentleman playing basketball in a wheelchair, mm-hmm. of all things, wheelchair rugby. Yeah. He, oh, it's rugby. Yeah, yeah I thought did, it was basketball. He did play basketball. Now he plays. How rugby. about that? Yeah, Good on him. Yeah. It's amazing. Talk about motivation. There oh, you go. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah. What, are, what are some of the most common issues that you see in leaders? Well, I was going to uh, – let me just uh, finish answering your question. Is okay. That, is that really actually, believe it or not, the reason why I ended up working with leaders quite um, exclusively um, or mostly is that um, I actually was in that really deep sickness and I was – Passed out on the couch, or not passed out, but I was laying on the couch binging on Netflix. I sort of, you know, made myself feel a little bit better by watching documentaries, you mm-hmm. know, instead of just movies. Um, but, and I it was in such physical and emotional pain that I finally just surrendered. I just laid on that couch and I just said, I can't handle this. I'm in so much pain. I surrender and I surrendered to the pain. And my body just went into this deep, just like tingly, like just, I just didn't feel my body anymore. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. I just this I don't, I don't know, it was a voice or just a message or something that just said world leaders. And so, I was So like, an OBE what? and bingo. It said world leaders and it said your purpose is to work with world leaders. And I shot up <laughs> on the couch, like sat up and I was like, What? <laughs> it was it was crazy. It was not it wasn't crazy. I mean, people might think they're crazy you know, I'm crazy hearing this. But what happened was I thought Gosh, okay, you know what? This is so intense. I said, I don't believe in, I, I didn't quite believe in my ability right. to really work with world leaders. I didn't even have a client at the time because I was you so sick. You would have had a clue at the time. I, I was think. just so, yeah. And so, but I thought, you know what? This is so strong. I'm just going to trust it and just so, see what happens. And that's actually, and it's a, there's a whole story around this, but that's actually what within, within, Five or six months I was speaking at the United Nations. Well, there you go. Talk so about a, go. a fast time. I mean, yeah. how do you fix those issues with leaders? I mean, uh, you know, they're all different. They well, all have, they're all have, they surely they've got their own issues. Every one of them. You know, the, leaders are human beings, just like the rest of us. It's oh, just sure. like inmates are human beings, just like the rest of us. Because some people have said that to me too. Well, how do, oh my gosh, how do you work with those people? And they've done terrible things and they must have so much, you know, so many wounds. And they do. Their wounds aren't necessarily that different, though, from ours. As I said, the X powers are universal. Everybody right. has X powers right. inside and everybody has M powers inside. And it's just a matter of, trans, of transforming them back to N powers. Um, so with leaders, I have noticed some patterns. I actually have an ebook that I, I need to get out there that I've been working on that talks about some of the specific wounds that I have discovered among leaders. Um, but th- there are certain wounds that do lead to people to um, behave certain ways in leadership positions um, that also cause leaders to not want to to think they don't need they don't have any problems right. to to think or to act like everything's fine when everything's not fine. Um, which is one of the things why I really do love working with leaders. I often like to say I like working with the toughest of the tough, mm. you know, people who seem tough on the outside, but really they've got so well, much Well, I was going to say, wouldn't, wouldn't they have more pressure because they can't afford to show it? Yeah, yes, there. That that is definitely um, one of the issues. Right. Um, you know, just by example, one of the things I've discovered with a lot of leaders is a lot of them have. Um, I'm going to use the term "daddy issues" because a lot of people know the term "daddy issues," but it's really true. A lot of times they had uh, fathers who were highly critical, uh, dismissive, um, not acknowledging them, and so they felt like they had to prove themselves to their fathers. So that's actually something I have discovered in a lot of leaders. A lot of leaders also. So we're expected to be like adults before they really should have been when they were still children. So, for okay. example, there are leaders who a lot of them, um, you know, they're, they're maybe their parents were alcoholics. And so they weren't really allowed to be a child. They were constantly having to take care of their parents. And so they learned my job is to take everyone else, take care of everyone else. And no one's going to take care of me. So there are certain um, patterns among the wounds and the beliefs among leaders. But ultimately, leaders are they're, they're, we're all human beings and we all have our wounds. And so it's just simply a matter of really saying, hey, yes, you may be in this leadership position. Yes, you may have all this money. Yes, you may be the envy of all of your peers. And you're a human being. Well, give me an idea. When we talk about leaders, are they all just CEOs and executives of business? Or are you dealing with politicians? Are you dealing with, you know, 
unusual jobs of yes. people around the world. Yeah, I've worked with people in political positions. I've worked with CEOs. Um, I work with um, heads of not-for-profits. Um, but but also sometimes I have people who are authors, you know, so they're leaders in their own ways. Okay. Uh, you know, in other words, they may not be leading an, um, a big company, but they're thought leaders. And so it's really important that in their work that they show up. Right. The as, key is thought leaders here, right? And that's my, that's my whole mission, actually, is, you know, it's funny when I got that message about your purpose is to work with world leaders i really scoffed at it i was like that's just in what, what the out of body about? experience of but, emily eldridge i know right <laughs> but but you know but but that's why i also say that as soon as i started honoring it things started happening in amazing ways and so that's why i always say tell people trust your truth even if it seems crazy or even if you think you're not capable of it mm-hmm. trust your truth because you were divinely designed for your unique truth and yes, I, so when, whatever yes. i teach is not some just woo woo we oh that sounds nice <laughs> It really does come from my own personal experience and implementing those things that I've been guided to learn. There you go. Well, explain to me, Emily, the difference where, because I I think what stood out for me was when you said you totally let go Mm. and it, it was more or less like an experience of, look, here you go, whoever you are. Is it a God? Yeah. Is it inner self? Whomever. Here, Mm -hmm. take Mm -hmm. me. I'm I'm done. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, show me, for God's sake, my angels, whomever it is. What were you thinking? Who were you letting go to? Um, Short answer, I don't know. (laughs) Um, But you did it. I did it. I knew, let's put it this way, I don't, you know, and there are different schools of thought that say Mm -hmm. you have to be very intentional about what you let go to or what kind of energies you call in, et cetera, et cetera. For me, though, I knew it was good. And whatever it was, was good. And that it was for, I had always, you know, back when I was really struggling to figure out what is my purpose? What is my path? I'm good at acting. I'm good at singing. I'm good at graphic design. I, I, I went through some of those periods too, where I would say I surrender. And I, I, and I just sort of said to, I don't know, God, the universe, whatever, the all that is. And I just said, use me for the highest good right. possible. Right. And so that's when things started to happen and change and stuff. And so in this case, uh, you know, I, 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 when I was surrendering, I was really just, I, I went, let's put it this way. I wasn't, I wasn't surrendering to something. To answer your question, it wasn't to anything. It was just I, I had been spending so much time and energy resisting the pain that I just let go and stopped resisting. Really, it was more just acceptance, deep mm-hmm. acceptance. So that's why it really did shock me when I got that message because I wasn't necessarily saying, hey, God, what do I do? Or, hey, universe, what do I do? It was just, I just surrender. I can't fight this pain anymore. And I knew that by fighting the pain, I was mm-hmm. only making it worse. Mm-hmm. So really, it was more just for my own, um, my own trying to be uh, free of the pain. Um, but I do think that's also a really good um, – that experience is a microcosm of what, of the macrocosm and of, of, of saying, uh, let's put it this way. I believe that we co-create with the universe. It's not all God or the universe and it's not all us. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's together. And so actually another purpose that my, the illness has served over the years is (laughs) I can't use these, these, I don't know. I can't use bad language on this radio. Can I? Um, One would prefer you, but but you can be yourself on the mark. Well, so one of the things is that because I was dealing with an illness that I felt I had no control and I didn't know how to make it any better. I, I mean, I ate differently. I did everything right and yet i was still did, sick did you ever pray um i would pray probably not in the i would i did uh, well there are few and there are few there are different ways of praying yeah i mean i can i can give you <laughs> right there are there really are all right and i, I and, didn't mean to put you on this no then. no no i can answer but to answer this question um uh uh, now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, that the illness, that what it, and I've, I've said this to other people, and I will, I will censor myself for this uh, show, but is what I discovered is that with, with this illness constantly coming into my life that I couldn't control and I finally did have to surrender, I realize now that it was like the universe was trying to say to me, Emily, sit the F 
down and shut the F up. Mm -hmm. It was like, stop fighting. Stop trying to figure this out. Stop trying to force things. Stop thinking that you're the one who has the answers. Right. And just give up. So when I say give up, mm -hmm. you know, when we say give up, we yeah. actually put our hands up. So it's uh, some people might say give it up to God. I just say give up, like to the universe, just give away. So it stopped trying to control everything. And so actually, it was because that I went because I went through that period that it really did force me now. Mm -hmm. So that nowadays, I've let go of so many things. And mm -hmm. and and when I get a message to to do something or an intuition to take action on something, I trust it. And I know that it's right. That's the way to do it. Yeah. We've uh, covered an awful lot of stuff. We've only got 15 minutes left. And oh, my I, gosh. I've got some great questions I want to get out to you. Okay. But let's, um, for those that are listening, you, they can check you out a little with LinkedIn.com too. Uh, the LinkedIn address is uh, LinkedIn.com slash in slash Emily Eldridge for that particular one. And, of course, today, popular ones are Facebook. There's Emily International. That's uh, facebook.com slash drawing out process slash the new self empowerment. No, that's the other website, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the other one. The yeah. other website is Facebook the new pages, self empowerment, yeah. uh, Facebook. Facebook.com slash empowers and expires. Yeah. They're, they're, all righty? <laughs> yeah, they're different. Twitter, Instagram, there. YouTube, all that jazz. <laughs> when you go to a site, Really, the, the new self empowerment dot com. Yeah, it's the one with a lot of info on it. It's a very yeah, good site. Yeah, a lot yeah. of stuff it on there. Explains empowers and expowers. What, the what have process. you learned as you've built your business now? Um, a short version. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are you saying I talk too much? <laughs> uh, I got a lot to share. Um, uh, what I've learned, honestly, is to build my bills. Build. Uh, let me explain this. Build my build. Build my business around myself. And what I mean by that is. Um, that I went through another, you know, mini dark night of the soul actually at the end of 2015 because I'd been trying to run my business the way I've been told to run my business or thought I was supposed to. But what I discovered is that that didn't, that didn't work for me. I right. actually burned out at the end of that year. And I was so extremely unhappy. And my husband told me later on, <laughs> poor sweetheart, he's been through so much with me. <laughs> he's so wonderful. Is he said after I did finally get through that mini dark night and really started to, to reformat my business so that it served me in support me and so that I could feel joy when I was working on it. He said to me um, later on, he said, yeah, that was really hard. He said, I, I would sit in the garage before coming into the house thinking, oh no, what state is she going to be in when I get there? Yeah, it's because I was like, because I'd be sobbing my brains out. You know, I was working so hard, but I wasn't getting certain results. And I also was so unhappy. And so that's what I've learned in business is that we really need to tune into ourselves. That's actually one big thing. The other one is that there with the empowers, it's not just this like nice self-development, you know, um, you know, fun thing. You can actually use your empowers in business. And call on your empowers to give you the answers in business. And so I do that. I consult with my inner empowers. We all have our own. Mm. And I consult with mine. And they're the ones who actually signal to me if I need to take care of myself right. or if I have certain activities I need to take care of. And so when I listen to my empowers and I honor them, everything goes so much better and so much easier. And how, how does one tune in again to the empowers so easily? One, so the, the simple technique that I teach teach about how to honor your empowers is every morning when you wake up and I have a postcard, you can download it off my site. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, you can download this off, off my site as well. Um, this how to honor your empowers, you just put it in your email address, and they'll send it to you. Um, is that when you um, uh, just wake up in the morning, and ask each of your empowers individually, they're called the sovereign, the free spirit and the impresario. Now, of course, that's on the website. Mm -hmm. um, but you ask each of them individually, what's one small thing I can do today that would feel good for you? So you're asking them what would feel good for them. And it's got to be small because the impresario, which is the very left brain part, wants to give often a whole to-do list. Oh, you can do this, 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 this. Right, like, okay. No, 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 no. Brain no. it in. One. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then – but but you'd be – you'd be. I mean most people are shocked and surprised or sometimes just – confirmed by what their empowers tell them. And so that's a very simple way of tuning in to mm. those parts. And they're with some people say, well, I'm not sure what this one's saying or that. I say, just be patient because they are there. You just may have been taught not to honor it and listen to it. So that free spirit, that inner free spirit, people often right. don't listen to that little inner child that's so joyful because we see that child as not, uh, not uh, practical. 
well, no, 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 I can't, I can't do that fun thing because that's not practical and okay. I have to work now. But here's what I've discovered. And again, from my own experience as well, is that actually what happens is when you honor your free spirit, which is that sweet little joyful child, creative and fun, when you honor what that free spirit wants you to do, that small thing it wants you to do that day, it then fills you with the most incredible power and energy that then fuels the work that you have to do. So that's why that part of us is actually just as vital to our own survival and our own businesses. So, so now else. the the X powers then. Mm-hmm. The X, the, those are the N powers. They're the N powers. Yeah. You, in terms of honoring your X powers, that's you don't. That would be more like the drawing out process. Okay. So it's more about healing the X powers and okay. helping them recognize that they don't need to carry that pain anymore, or they don't need to act that way anymore. Emily, what is? I mean, you've done so much. What are you most proud of? Mm-hmm. Um, so I am really proud of the impact that I've had so far on people's lives or that this work, I should say, has had. I really do. I'm a conduit for the work. Um, I'm so proud of that. It excites the hell out of me. Is it fulfilling? It's extremely fulfilling. So it's we're not deeply fulfilling. we're not, you know, disappointed that something's not being utilized here. Oh, you mean in terms of like the parts of me? Yeah, all the parts of you. So that's where it's in terms of designing my own business, I've designed my business so it uses all those parts of me. Okay. So that's why I do my own website design. It uses that graphic design. Oh, I get it now. That's why I use my speaking. It uses the acting and the singing. That's why I do writing and, um, you know, And you even have your own podcast too, don't you, I think? Uh, No, I don't anymore, but I used to. You used to. I used to have my own podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's where it's all come together with the business. Um, but uh, where do you see it going? Then what's what's your what's your highest vision for uh, for the business now? I want everyone in the world talking about their empires and their expats. <laughs> hey, that's a few billion. People I want down. everyone <laughs> in the world because because um, because this is the simplest. And, and I'm holding up the po- the postcard mm-hmm, as we're talking. Mm-hmm. This is the simplest. It's a, an incredibly simple system for self understanding. And what people need more than anything, in my opinion, and my, my whole mission is to heal humanity from the inside out. Okay. And I see that the problems we have with with our um, civilization are because we're sick. We are emotionally, mentally sick on the inside. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it has to do with because we have not been taught how to see ourselves truthfully. And in terms of, remember I talked earlier about the X powers and that there's, they're not bad. No. They're just parts that have been impacted by pain and fear. A lot fear. of people are scarred, aren't they? Yeah, we're scarred. We're all wounded. So when we actually learn to honor our wounds, it actually calms those X powers down, helps us feel more at peace and helps us honor our M powers more so that we show up more joyfully and more peacefully in the world. Mm-hmm. We light up. When we light up, we light up the world. When we are more at peace, we create a more peaceful world. Well, yes, and then so it, it really on. is. So I really do mean that. I want everyone Everyone understanding that they have M powers, and I want them understanding their X powers so that they can achieve that level of peace and healing and self understanding and okay. self awareness so that we create more peaceful civilization. So, anybody listening right now, the best thing for them to do to understand more and to get into this, what would you recommend is to go to your site? Which one first? I would go to the new self, the, the new self empowerment.com or just new self empowerment.com. They both work. And you can read about M powers and X powers in addition. There's also a free online program that I offer, and you can get on there and you can take the program, and that goes even deeper into mm. powers and X powers, and it teaches some of the drawing out process. Well, how techniques. long is that? How big is that? Can, can anybody do that? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody can do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's in four sections. I think it's three or four. I've reformatted it recently, but the first section is all about M powers. Okay. The second, so it's honor your M powers, and the second one is how do you heal those X powers? Well, this powers. would give you a great understanding of it. Yes, all, wouldn't it? understanding and starting to recognize what's like oh that's what's going on with me or oh that's what that part of me is really trying to tell me that's what people do you get people telling you that that, oh my gosh that it's like a bulb has gone on for them on top of their head or something all the time all the time and it's so fun because these might be people that i haven't even met maybe they've seen me speak or they happened upon my website or i also send out um quotes every day and and they'll say oh my gosh that that changed my life that made such a difference or i mean i love it i have people who i you know like i think i spoke in colombia like three or four years ago and i still have people who say i've been using your empowers technique and it has changed my life wow so that's, that's uh, it's exciting that it's would really be exciting fun. that yeah. that's nice feedback when and, you get something like that isn't it yeah, and well, and also I'm all about 
people honoring their own power. This is not me like being some kind of no, you're the guru. Conduit. It's really about people. We all have the power. We, I, well, I think I said this in our other conversation. You have all of the power you need to be everything you're, you're here to be. And that really it's, it's all by honoring those M powers and healing those X powers. That's when you truly embrace your power and live your truth. Hmm. And this is the lady to make you realize that, Emily Eldridge. I mean, what does she do? Well, when it comes to work and life, most leaders are running on only one of their core powers. They neglect the other two. Traditional methods and incentives can't fix this, right? Well, you would know that, so maybe it's worth a visit to the site. I hope this interview for you today has somehow, some way, you know, um, made you feel that there's hope, because there is. And when I went on the site, I had a good look around this drawing. She actually shows drawing. In fact, there were videos, weren't they? Mm-hmm. Videos of these monsters and creatures and things. Transforming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I thought, ooh, ooh, that's nasty, that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but they're in all of us. Mm-hmm. They're in all of us. And, you know, it, it would be nice for everybody to uh, go back to being good again, child. Mm. happy and only know the one thing maybe we wouldn't have so much misery around the world today as that we do have it comes it comes there's from a direct co- co- uh, correlation isn't there mm-hmm. to, it comes from wounds you know as they say hurt people hurt people yeah, that's right yeah and have you found in your travels and, and all your lectures and touring and so on is it more men or women that need the help oh <laughs> We all need the help, honey. <laughs> um, it's it's both. It's both. Um, you know, we all have our own wounds. And, you know, whether we're born a man or a woman, um, of course, does determine how society treats us in a lot of ways mm-hmm. and how we treat ourselves, right? If society treats us a certain way, we tend to treat ourselves a certain way as well. Um, I We are all waking up, I hope. I believe and I hope um, that we are all waking up to our own true powers and to honoring both the masculine and the feminine on the inside. I think that we've been in too much of a binary world in terms of, and I don't mean by, you know, just binary world in terms of thinking, well, I, if I'm a man, that I have to be masculine. Or if I am a woman, I need to be feminine. And it's just not true. I have a lot of parts of me that someone might say are masculine. And at the same time, I show up as a, you know, five, nine tall blonde woman, mm. you know, and I'm clearly a woman. So it's, to me, it's just about honoring all parts of the self, you know, however well, you were divinely it was a designed. bit of all of us and everything, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. When it all boils down. Absolutely. Um, where are you traveling next? I mean, this this is on all the time, of course, uh, on uh, my site and on the uh, Business Radio Network site across America. You, you never know. It gets repeated and repeated, so never, you never come off. You're there for life now. <laughs> but uh, over the next year, we're in 2019. As an example, June on, where would you be going? Or May, June on now? You've got some big stuff coming up? I'll be in New York in May and June. I'll be working with clients, and, and then I'm... Later in the summer, I'm going to be in Morocco. Morocco. And I'll be working with um, young leaders uh, as part of an organization called World Merit. And they have a big uh, event there in Morocco. So it'll be my second time mentoring them and speaking to them. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And you don't, you feel safe going there? Absolutely. All right. Oh, yeah. Do you go on your own? Do you go as an entourage? Does Pago go with you? What's the deal? Well, so where I usually do the work in Morocco is at um, the Ben Gedir. uh, It's in Ben Gedir. It's um, a university there. Okay. And um, and so, you know, the university is, is we're all working together. And okay. then I sometimes spend a little time in Marrakesh. And this next time, mm-hmm. I don't know, I might go to Casablanca or something. Oh, yeah, stop yeah. dropping names, will you? YouTube. Ah, you asked. Emily International, <laughs> YouTube.com. Uh, okay, go to that one. That's easy to find her there. And you've got Daily Breaths. And look, she's got all sorts of stuff. Uh, this is another one. Dub, 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 dailybreath.me. Yeah? Yeah. What is that? So when you go there, put your email in, you're actually, every single day you'll start to get um, emails, or every weekday I should say, you get emails. They're just one or two sentences, but just a quick jolt of inspiration. Oh, very it's, nice. Yeah. Because you're very good. You you have special offers for, uh, you know, for your listeners. You have tickets, uh, gifts uh, for your readers and people that uh, also watch your videos, which is very nice of you. And if people want to email you, they can, emily at emilyinternational.com. Mm-hmm. Healer, 
Oh, what is she? She's a leader healer. She's a facilitator. She's a speaker. And she's a bloody nice person as well. <laughs> right? <Thank you. laughs> Emily Eldridge, thank you. And thank you and be safe and for what you do for humanity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mark. I so appreciate it.